Welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. Today, I'm interviewing Nolan Sandrin. Nolan is a commercial real estate syndicator and infinite banking practitioner. Nolan has a deep understanding of using real estate and cash value whole life insurance to enhance returns and mitigate taxes. Nolan, welcome to our podcast. Sari, thank you for having me, man. One of my favorite things is talking with like-minded people. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to interview you. It's, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I know we're going to talk about infinite banking and real estate and other ways to use infinite banking. I'm really excited about that. Before we jump into that, do you mind sharing with us who you are and, and a little bit more on your background? So uh, long story short, I used to be a professional baseball player with the Oakland A's, Chicago White Sox, uh, Washington Nationals. I uh, While I was playing baseball, I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which everybody if you are an entrepreneur or somebody that's aspiring, you've probably heard of it and you've read it and it changes your your mindset. And it changed my life personally. While I was playing though, I started to buy real estate. I started to do that whole number. Uh, I actually was fortunate. I had about 12 rental properties by the time I retired. And I, on paper, was financially free, which sounds a little ridiculous, but I had more, my expenses and my income wasn't very much at that time, but I was uh, playing baseball. I, while I was uh I had just got released by the Washington Nationals. I started, I was like, I'm going to cash in my chips, Annie up in something else. Started doing medical sales. But at that time, I got introduced to a friend of mine who I now work with. Uh, his name is Mike Schwally. And he said, hey, um, I was playing golf. And uh, he goes, hey, you're a real estate guy. I think I might have something that I need to introduce you to. I got to show you. It's this thing called infinite banking. I was an arrogant little kid. I was 27 and I thought I knew everything because I had a couple of rental properties. And I was like, I don't need this insurance guy telling me what I don't know. And so I put him off. I, I basically kind of big leagued him and I act like I was too cool for school. And so he was like, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Just look at it. You know, just uh, just read the book, Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash yeah. and try and poke holes in it. He's like, I would encourage you like just to see if you can poke holes in it yourself. And so I, I read the book in spite just to try and prove him wrong. And as I was reading, as I was reading, I was like, this guy is making a lot of sense. And I even talked to my wife. I was like, I, I think this guy's onto something here. She was like, he's an insurance guy. He's trying to sell you something, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but basically I just, I, I just went all in. I was like, this, this makes a lot of sense to me and I want to do it. I want to become an infinite banker. You know, I want to, you know, redirect and, and recapture that outgoing interest. I want to be having tax-free growth. I want to have all the uninterrupted compounding, all that kind of stuff. And this is all I was finishing baseball and then still um, doing medical sales. Yeah. Then they the the company I was working for was Stryker Sports Medicine. They changed my uh, territory over to an entirely different city. Mike, he said, look, you know, you've know, you given me so many leads. You're a firm believer in this. I'm actually a lot more passionate personally about infinite banking and real estate than I was shoulder anchors and rotator cuff surgeries. So I quit my medical sales job to go full into teaching infinite banking and coupling real estate with that. And uh, man, now that I'm here, I'm doing full time um, commercial real estate syndications, uh, industrial warehouse, flex space, and teaching investors and people how to uh, completely essentially eliminate taxes by uh, using the infinite banking concept and coupling it with commercial real estate. So that's where I am today. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Definitely. It's it's a surprise to a lot of people, right? When they learn about infinite banking, it's not something that they're, they've are they grown up with. It's not, a, it's not a typical or usual subject, but I love how uh, your friend introduced you to the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. As you were reading the book, what were some things that you're like, you know what? this would actually help me out a lot in my life. Like what were some of the things that you noticed that you're like, you know, this is actually beneficial to me. Great question. Number one is again, me trying to prove Mike wrong was yeah. uh, I know I can get a higher rate of return uh, in my real estate investment. I knew I was, I, I, in my head, that was my initial, always my go, my fallback to, I can get a higher rate of return somewhere else. And again, he kind of said, look, kid, get out of here until you come back and you're open-minded, right? So he actually had to kick me out of his office a couple of times because I was just too cool for school. But um, the main thing that I think that I took away from that is, well, number one is we finance everything that we do. We're yeah. either we're either borrowing someone else's money and paying them back with interest, or we save up our money, we spend it, and then we give up the ability to earn interest on that dollar. So that was a huge light bulb that went off for me was I, because we haven't earned anything on in on anything in a savings account or checking account in a long time. Yeah. We don't really account for the opportunity cost when we spend our own cash. 
And uh, I discovered that and, and Mike and the guys at now and then associates here in Birmingham um, brought that to the forefront. Like this is a, this is a thing that we don't really comprehend and understand that there is a cost when we use our own capital and it's that opportunity cost of that dollar continuing to grow as if that dollar never left. That was number one. The second was how there's even a hitting second tax on top of our taxes to the government. And what I mean is when we go and spend or you know, we go trade our time for money at our W-2, our employer mm-hmm. will withhold taxes to go whatever those are, you know, to go pay the government income tax, social security, Medicare tax, whatever it is. When you go and pay that dollar to the government. Not only are you paying a percentage of your income to the government, but you also have given up the ability to earn on that dollar that's now gone for the rest of your life. So I I discovered that if you can save a dollar of tax today, you are going to be adding three to four dollars of net worth down the line in your life because you're still earning on that dollar that would have otherwise been killing the compounding. And then number three and most important, I've discovered that when you go and compare infinite banking to an investment, um, you can't do that because you would be already doing that with your capital today. Because right now it's sitting in a bank account. It's sitting in a checking account ready to deploy into some investment. But with investment, you have to take on risks. There's And you have to hang out with your silent partner of the government with those investments, capital gains, depreciation, recapture, any type of capital gains with stock markets, things like that. But most importantly, um, I, you can't compare an infinite banking return to an investment because because it's not an investment. It's yep. just a high powered savings tool that you can couple with what you're already doing. We, I, I try and tell my clients, my investors, we're not changing anything. We're just going to redirect our capital through a policy first, let it touch it. We're going to pull it back out and then deploy it. It's yep. almost as if thinking about a distribution center like Walmart, for example, yep. When Walmart has um, any type of product that comes across the world that's coming from China or Indonesia or India, and it comes over to the States, that product doesn't go directly to uh, Northwest Arkansas into a uh, onto the shelf. No, yeah. first, when it gets into the United States, it hits a distribution center first. Yeah. That distribution center then knows where to deploy out that product. That's going to be the most efficient way to earn a return on that product. Infinite banking is the exact same way. Instead of having that capital go from your left pocket or your checking account into an investment, let's have it rerouted or redirected through a policy first or a distribution center. And then let's have that capital deployed from that distribution center because it's going to be so much more efficient. And so that's kind of the way that I've learned and I've discovered how to use my own capital in my own real estate deals and also helping my investors and clients do the same thing with what they want to accomplish. Yeah, I love that distribution center. It makes a lot of sense when you put it that way, like having it go through the whole life policy first. Now, what are some of the advantages to do? So like, for example, you have scenario A, where you just go from checking account to real estate investment versus scenario B, where you have cash goes into life policy. And then from the life policy, it goes invested in, it gets invested into a real estate deal. Kind of compare those two scenarios. Sure. So number one, let's just let's just put an apple to an apple. If you have yeah. $100,000 in a bank account, versus $100,000 in a whole life policy in cash value. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to compare this strategy, number one, to a home equity line of credit. That's the way that I like to describe it. And I'm sure you're the same is um, when you go and borrow money from your home equity line of credit, let's say you have a half a million dollar home and you've got $100,000 of equity because you've been making your mortgage payments each and every month. As everybody knows, there's principal and interest inside of that payment. Half of that, sometimes more, sometimes less, goes to principal, yeah. and the other half goes to interest to the bank that financed the mortgage. Yeah. Well, if they've built up hundred thousand dollars of equity, and you want it, you and your wife want to redo your home, you want to redo a kitchen or a bathroom, and you go and borrow from your HELOC, your home equity line of credit, the bank's going to write you a check for fifty grand from that. Now, I would ask, does that actually interrupt the appreciation of your home, or does the bank? you know, put caution tape around the guest bedroom. No, they don't, they don't do that. Right. They just, what they're going to do is they're going to slap a second position lien on your home behind your first position mortgage. Right. That's the, that's what a bank would do. They essentially created that money out of thin air. If you know, we want to get down to that rabbit hole, but, but in reality though, life insurance or infinite banking or whole life is the exact same thing as, as a home equity line of credit. The only difference is, is in the nature of the collateral. And what I mean is, is with your HELOC, the collateral to your line of credit is real estate. 
That's yeah. what you're borrowing against. And in life insurance, when you've built up cash value or you made your premium deposits, which is building equity in your home, or I'm sorry, building equity in your policy, the equity that you borrow against is essentially the collateral is the death benefit. That's what you're essentially borrowing against. And so that's the lever that you're allowed to take as time goes on. You have more access to the death benefit as time goes on. So to bring it full circle, when you're going to go and compare where should we borrow the money from our life insurance policy or should we take cash from a bank account to go buy a real estate deal? When you go pull out 50 grand from a bank account that you were earning 0.25% interest on, not only are you paying, you're going to get a 1099 from Uncle Sam if you earned any amount of capital in that thing, any interest. But when you took took out 50 grand, you're now earning pennies on whatever's left in there versus an infinite banking, you're earning, you know, depending upon the carrier and everything in between, you're earning a pretty significant uh, interest rate that's not only guaranteed, but it's tax-free. And even when you access the capital, it continues to grow in the background as if it never left. So you're able to kind of kill two birds with a stone and earn on both sides of the coin. Yeah. And that's a really good description of those two. And I would even add, when you go to take out the home equity equity line of credit, you have to qualify for that. You have to ask for permission for that. You have to show some sort of income. They pull your credit. Whereas when you go and borrow against your life insurance policy, there's no credit check, right? There's no credit requirement. The only collateral you have is just the policy. So that's really big because imagine if you have a lot of equity in your house, but you get laid off. How are you going to get a line of credit now against your house? And you have to qualify for it. So that could put you in a tough situation. Whereas when you have your life policy, there's no credit qualification, right? You know, that's a great point because I actually, I just had a conversation with a guy yesterday. He, uh, he's got a ton of equity in his home and his primary and also his rental property. And uh, he's wanting to do infinite banking. He's got some retained earnings. He's got some cash in his account. But uh, he was asking about, he's like, I'm just looking for some more control. He's calling his banker up and he can't, he can't, for whatever reason, the bank's not willing to give him a line of credit on his properties. And I'm just like, Dude, there's no better way to do this than you you have complete control over this line of credit. Like you just mentioned, not only do you control, you you borrow the money out, you're the owner of the contract. Yeah. So number one, it's your money. Whenever you want it, they don't have to, there's no questions asked. There's like you said, there's no credit checks. You borrow the money out for as long as you want. You pay them back if mm-hmm. and when you want to. You charge yourself an interest rate if you want to. I would encourage you to do that, to be an honest banker. But most mm-hmm. importantly, you know, you amortize it out on your terms and your schedule. And so the I think that's the beauty of it. Most people are, um, in my opinion, customers at the bank. Yeah. It takes a mindset shift to become an owner of the bank because, um, again, we're all accustomed as the 99 percenters on paper that we just go to the bank and we deposit, but we don't actually have any equity in that bank and PNC or Regions Bank or Wells Fargo. Yeah. Um, we're not stockholders of that. But with infinite banking, it takes a mindset shift, but you become an actual owner of that mutual life insurance company. And that allows you to not only get an absolutely guaranteed interest rate on your money, but you get to participate in the profits of that business yeah. as well and earn that as a tax-free dividend each and every year as time goes on. Yeah, definitely. Before I started uh, infinite banking, I used to I used to like hate interest. Uh, but then after I started taking out life insurance loans, and I'm paying the life insurance company interest on those loans, right? Because you have to. Uh, it's a different perspective now. It's not going to some insurance company I have nothing to do with. It's going to an insurance company that I'm a mutual owner of. That's exactly right. And I and I think uh, even more so too, it's uh, one of the guys in my office, he, he had a great analogy, but he said, you know, if you could go to you know, if Wells Fargo has approached you or whoever it is, Bryant Bank, you know, Community First Bank, West Alabama Bank, you know, any any small local bank and said, hey, you've been such an amazing client for us um, as a customer. We'd like to offer you some equity in our bank. So every single year when we derive a profit, you know, you're earning a you're you're going to earn a little slice of of profit in that. I would ask you. Would you go and get a loan from Bank of America or would you get a loan from West Alabama Bank? You're going to go to the bank that you're a part that you're an owner of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to go somewhere else. Even if that interest rate is smaller, maybe by a hair somewhere else, every dime that you send somewhere else is no longer going to work for you and it's gone forever. We're here. Every dime that you funnel back into your policy or that goes in a profit to the insurance company. You're always going to get a slice of, and not to mention it grows every single year, literally almost guaranteed tax free. Yeah, exactly. That was my next point is that like, I love real estate. I'm a real estate investor myself, but real estate doesn't grow all the time. You know, if you look at like the difference between 2008 and like 2019, like during that period, like some houses were the same value. 
between between that 10 year, 11 year, but but not with whole life insurance, right? Like it kept growing no matter what. So yeah, I, you know, I do love real estate. I think it's a wonderful investment, but still whole life insurance is far more stable and has far more growth than any other asset class. Absolutely. And and not to mention too, it's um there's no there's nothing else out there that I mean, and I don't throw around guarantee. Nobody, it's hard to say yeah. the word guarantee anywhere. But when someone can say, hey, you're guaranteed to have this X, Y, and Z every single year, and there's really nothing else out there that can that can provide that, even in a bank account. I mean, you have the FDIC that insures yes. up to 250 grand. But if you really wanted to pull the layer back, the FDIC only has like $8 billion in their account that can insure you when there's like $17 trillion in checking <laughs> and savings accounts. So Realistically, I mean, the FDIC is insuring about one penny of every dollar that's in the checking account right now. So I don't know how safe that is. We'll probably get bailed out by the government, but yes. still, at the end of the day, it's just not. It's the, the whole life insurance at the all on the other side of the spectrum for for about every dollar in that cash value, you've got about a dollar twenty five insuring yeah. it versus about one penny. Exactly, and and because these life insurance companies they're regulated by the states, they have to have a certain amount of reserves, depending on how many clients they have, all the all the claims they have to pay all the cash values they have to meet. So they, they're required to keep a certain amount in reserves, whereas banks are like the opposite. Like for every dollar they take in, they can lend out like 10 times that. And insurance companies have far greater regulatory requirements, which is good for the clients because you want your money sitting somewhere that's much safer and more predictable than with you know banks or other types of institutions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, like you just mentioned, I mean, it's the fractional reserve lending yeah. system that's in the United States government. If, if anybody's out there listening, thinking about a book you want to read, check out The Creature from Jekyll Island. And uh, that's a book that will change your perspective on uh, on uh, at least money and understanding how money is created and talking about the fractional reserve lending system. But um, But at the end of the day, you putting your money with a life insurance company, it's a lot safer than leaving it out there, hopefully hoping the FDIC will insure it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, this is wonderful. We've talked about the tax benefits, right? We talked about the liquidity benefits, the value, the growth of it. Can you tell us more details about how you're using your policy or, or multiple policies right now? Sure. Yeah. So my wife and I, we currently have four policies about to have a fifth one because my little son is four months old and we got to wait till he's six, six months old to to put a policy on him. But uh, the, the main rate, the main way that I uh, use my life insurance policies, maybe maybe a little bit different than others, but because I like to use permanent, I use my own my own. Uh, and you, Sarah, you understand this, but for somebody that's um, interested in real estate or or understanding how this kind of thing works, so let's say that I buy, I like to buy industrial warehouses now. That's kind of my game. But let's use a let's use like a single family home for example. So. Um, if there's a property that's in a uh, cul-de-sac and every and there's ten houses in there, nine of them are going for a hundred thousand. That tenth property, whether you have granite countertops and you have really nice vinyl plank flooring, it's most likely going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars because the other nine houses in that cul-de-sac are worth the same thing. So what I'll do as an investor is I'm buying things at a discount. I'm buying things that are um, you know either off market or whatever. But let's say the the owner of that property, he just got a new job in San Francisco. He needs to leave town. Uh, I buy that property from him for $70,000, for example. I write a check from my life insurance policy for $70,000. And so I'm buying the property on paper for cat, with cash. Yeah. So I don't have any outstanding payments to anybody else. But what I'll then do is I'll put $10,000 into the property. I'm in it right now for $80,000 of my own capital of my own policy loan, uh, lean on my death benefit. But then what I'll do then is I'll stick a renter in there, call it, you know, 1500 bucks or whatever it is. After six months, I've seasoned that in regards to the bank's eyes. I'll go then get an appraisal and refinance that property. And so, because again, like I mentioned, all other nine homes in that cul-de-sac are worth a hundred thousand. The bank is going to appraise that property for a hundred thousand because that's what the other houses are. That's what the comps are. And the bank is willing to write me a check uh, a loan to value of 80% of the value of that home. They appraised it for a hundred. So they'll write me a check for $80,000 uh, based upon the appraisal. And so what they'll do is they'll write me a check back for 80,000. If you remember, I was in it for 80,000 with my purchase price plus some rehab. The bank wrote me a check for 80,000. So I've now cashed out my equity. I take that 80,000. I put it back into my policy because again, I wasn't on someone else's hook. I I controlled that line of credit. I didn't pay somebody. I mean, I, I'll charge myself interest, of course. 
but I didn't, I, I wasn't controlled by somebody else on that line of credit. But then now you're thinking, well, now knowing you got a mortgage, you got to pay, you know, $700 a month in a mortgage payment on that 80 grand. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But I have, remember, I have a renter that's paying me $1,500 a month. So not only did I use my policy loan to get me into a property, I then borrowed from a traditional lender with an amortization of 20 years and, uh, you know, decent interest rate, maybe some decent terms. But most importantly, I'm putting 600 650 bucks a month in my pocket. That's not only tax free because I get to use depreciation, all my mortgage interest deductions, the property tax, the insurance, that's all essentially a write off on that property. But I was able to use my life insurance policy to get me into that deal because I had the agility because I could pull the trigger on it in two to three business days versus somebody else. Like you mentioned earlier, Sari, somebody has to go and qualify for that line of credit. I wrote, I called the, uh, my company up and said, I need a policy loan ASAP. They wrote me a check in two business days and I was able to close. So that's the velocity. That's the efficiency of these things. And it's able to get me into deals and to be agile and to create opportunities that other people would have to sit on the sideline and pass over because they didn't have the opportunities with the liquidity that I might have had. Yeah. I, I love that example. I'm, I'm glad you shared that because once you got the 80,000 back from the bank, right, you put that back towards your policy, paid off that loan. Now you can repeat that cycle again. So you're not giving up liquidity. As a matter of fact, you're amplifying the amount of investments you could take on and you're amplifying the returns you could take on because you're getting the appreciation in the, in the property and you're still getting the appreciation in your policy. So you're not giving up one for the other. Rather, you're you're growing multiple and you can keep repeating that cycle. You can get more properties, even more policies. And it becomes to the point where the policies of the properties are working for you. That's exactly right. And uh, I mean, that's just that's just on a personal way we do things. You can almost like you said, you can almost recycle the same dollar. Yeah. Uh, I, I recycle the same 80, 100, 50, 100, you know. $300,000 every, you know, every time we go buy something. But so what we do um, with our clients and my accountant and our attorney is we've created a little um, comprehensive plan. And what I mean is uh, if, if, if somebody doesn't back in 2017, the, the jobs, the jobs and tax act um, that Mr. Trump passed, mm -hmm. um, you're allowed to take which maybe people have heard before of, of not only depreciation on property, but there's a thing called bonus depreciation. And what that allows you to do is essentially front load um, some cost or expense uh, into the first year when you purchase a piece of real estate. So what do I mean by this? So let me just step back and I'll, and I'll walk through this. But but what we what, when you go buy a million dollar uh, industrial warehouse, for example, let's just use round numbers. Um, you're able to hire a cost segregation analyst or and they can do a cost segregation study. And what a cost segregation study does is essentially um, there's items inside of a, of a warehouse, inside of a property that are not um, attached to the structure, not the roof, not the siding, where from carpeting to computers to filing cabinets to um, any even, even vinyl plank flooring, uh, anything that's not attached to the property. And what you're allowed to do is take and, and those all have uh, depreciable timelines that are a lot faster than commercial real estate. Commercial real estate, you have to depreciate it over 39 years, mm -hmm. which is basically 2.564% each and every single year that you're allowed to depreciate. So this bonus depreciation allows you to actually front load um, all these items, you group them together and you front load the depreciation into the very first year. And you can take 100% depreciation on that property in the very first year. Why is that important? Because it ends up equating to about 25 to 30% of the entire purchase price in the first year. So for example, again, we go buy a million dollar building. That means we're able to depreciate on paper with bonus depreciation about $300,000. Now that's a passive loss on paper. We had, we lost that money on paper. So if we brought in 30 grand in income, that money is completely tax free. So now if you imagine we, we had a loss of $300,000, we earned 30. So now we have a passive loss now of $270,000. Now that sounds cool, but what are we supposed to do with that? Here's where this gets really fun and maybe your listeners will enjoy this, is I have investors that are higher income earners, higher wealth people, that are doctors, orthopedic surgeons, dentists, lawyers, attorneys, whatever, people that they only make money for the most time when their hands are in someone's mouth or in they're in the courtroom, right? Yeah. They don't have the ability to be in real estate 24-7 like maybe you and I do. 
So what we're able to do most of the time, if you're a, there's a thing called a real estate professional status yeah, that yeah. You, I'm sure you know, if you are in real estate for 750 hours per year and you spend over half of your time in real estate, you're able to turn, which was before a passive loss, that $270,000 loss into an active loss. Mm -hmm. And so if you're making $800,000 a year in your active income as a dentist or an attorney or a doctor, you're able to take that bonus depreciation loss and offset that against your active income. And so that lowers your taxable income on paper in, in the government's eyes. But again, the problem is most doctors and attorneys, they don't have the time, but they can't justify to the yeah. IRS that they're spending 50% of the time. So of course we introduce this idea and this concept to their spouse yeah. who may or may not be a real estate agent, may or may not know a whole lot about real estate, but if they are the ones that are buying the real estate, managing the tenant, managing the books, we can justify on paper that they're a real estate professional. Now, the spouse's passive loss is now an active loss against the other spouse's high income. Yeah. So what we're able to do then essentially is show them, and they end up saving themselves, you know, sometimes 80 to hundred thousand dollars in income and taxable income that would have otherwise just gone to the government. That's now actually back in their pocket because they had this active income of $800,000 that they're paying taxes on. And then now they essentially lowered that by 300 grand. And now they're only paying taxes on 500,000. So they're still paying taxes unless they bought a bigger building, but most importantly, they're going to be able to keep more money that would have otherwise just gone to the government. That's back in their pocket. And then to come full circle that then when they go buy that building, they need to inject $200,000 from somewhere. There's three buckets you can inject capital from. It's a taxable account, which is a checking or a savings account. There's a tax deferred account, your 401k, your IRA, yeah. or there's a third window, a third bucket, tax never, which is yeah. properly engineered life insurance. And so if you're able to couple st properly structured life insurance with commercial real estate investing, take the bonus depreciation and offset against your active income. Not only are you saving so much money this year in taxes because you got the bonus depreciation, but you won't be paying any taxes for the rest of your life on any of the growth inside of your life insurance policy while also having a legacy down the way when that time comes for you to graduate. And that's kind of what I do with my, with my clients and uh, what we do every day here um, in Birmingham. So that's, that's kind of my story, I guess. Mic drop. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That was awesome. Yeah. 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 So essentially, if you're in real estate and you're doing infinite banking, you could literally make as much money as you want, pay probably the least amount of taxes when you do it that way. I mean, that's truly thinking like a bank, right? Um, Nolan, it was a pleasure having you on the podcast, getting to know you. I love your energy and, and your knowledge about this topic. How can listeners connect with you and learn more about you? Dude, Sarah, thank you for having me. Uh, so you can find me on a couple things. I have a TikTok, okay? I am the infinite banking investor on TikTok. Um, and I just talk all things infinite banking and, and commercial real estate, show people how to underwrite deals, show people how to couple it with uh, life insurance. And uh, I guess you can find me on Instagram. I'm just Nolan Sandburn. I'm wide open. I love to help people learn. I, I'm a huge believer in the tide raising all ships. I just, I, I love when people understand this concept and they're open-minded. So this is something that has changed my life. And I know that if you be open-minded and you study yourself, it will change yours. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll be sure to add in the links you mentioned in the show notes below. This way listeners can connect with you uh, and learn more about you. I'm looking forward to bringing you back on the podcast. Awesome. Sari, thank you for having me, brother. Appreciate you having me on. Talk soon. Thanks. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.